Hello, this is the Goodly Christian Witch. I'd like to do the installment for Beltane celebration for Eight Sabbaths for Witches by Janet and Stuart Four. We are reading from this book uh, that we have used when we were in Wiccan groups many moons ago. And we have been reading from this book, again, Eight Sabbaths for Witches by Janet and Stuart Farrar. And we have, we have started with Midsummer or Summer Solstice and we have now come around full circle and to Beltane for next after Beltane is Midsummer again. So please see all of our other installments if you would like to see more about the various Sabbaths for witches. So before we begin and get into our Beltane celebration and reading about that from this book. I would like to begin by opening the circle and first we begin by creating a sacred time and we use a bell to create the sacred time. Ring it three times. And then we create a sacred space or a sacred circle, a sacred space. And we, we begin going clockwise or diocil. And we, when we close the circle, we'll go widdershins or counterclockwise to open it. This is something that we do for our, in our coven, this is something that we do for celebratory rituals. When we're doing magical working rituals, we do it a little bit different. We, we do various things going Wittershins and Diosil to deconstruct reality and then reconstruct it again with Wittershins deconstructing and Diosil constructing. So this is how we are going about this. So we're going to go ahead and create our sacred space. And when we begin, we're going to start in the east because that's the way we were taught. Some people start in the north. People start in various, in various directions. A very long time ago in Egypt, they used to start in the south. And they would, I think uh, that's when Set was, was head over, over Osiris. That was, that was before Set was villainized. Because Set was villainized in, in Egypt and then they said he was evil and that Horus was good or Osiris was good. So, you know, that's what happens as each generation goes and as new cultures take over, they villainize what came before and, and make what they are good and what anything that came before, anything that is other evil or bad. That's what all cultures do. Everybody does it and they do it even to their own people. Different generations do it to their own people. So we're here to try to restore some of what has been lost so that all is not lost like in the great in the great library of Alexandria where everything was was wiped out and also uh, Hypatia I believe she was a, a Greek scholar who invented the astrolab who was murdered by Christian men because she was intelligent and she was accomplished so we're going to go ahead and continue with this so we begin in the east because it's simply the way that we were taught. And then when we close, we close starting from the north going Wittershins, and we start in the east going Diasil. I would like to call in the guardians of the watchtower of the east and the archangel of the east, Raphael, who presides over the warm, moist winds of the east and the Sylphs of air, the elementals of the east. Come lend your magic to our circle now, so might it be. I'd like to call in the guardian of the watchtower of the south, the archangel Michael, guardian who presides over the hot dry winds of the south, and the salamanders, the elementals of the south. Come join our circle now and lend your magic to our circle now, so mote it be. I'd like to call upon the guardians of the, the angel of the watchtower of the west, 
the Archangel Gabriel, who rules over all of the wet, cold winds of the West and the undines, the elementals of water. Come lend your magic to our circle now, so mote it be. I'd like to call in the guardians of the watchtower of the north, the archangel Uriel, who presides over the cold, dry winds of the north, and the gnomes, the earth elementals. Come lend your magic to our circle now, so mote it be. I'd also like to call in the goddess above, the Shekinah, the goddess Keridwin, Demeter, Inanna, Mother Mary, all the goddesses of the sky and also the goddesses of fertility and light and Athena of wisdom. Lend your magic to our circle now, so mote it be. And like to call in the God of Earth, the God of Earth, Pan, Jesus Christ, and also Geb. Lend your magic to our circle now, so mote it be. All right. So the Book 8 says, for witches has this beautiful picture of all of the witches holding hands, making a ring around the moon. And we have eight Sabbaths for witches on the title page. Uh, and rights for birth, marriage, and death by Janet and Stuart Farrar, with illustrations by Stuart Farrar and photographs by Ian David and Stuart Farrar, published by Phoenix Publishing, Inc., and the copyright by Janet and Stuart Farrar in 1981. And also other books by the same authors, Janet and Stuart Farrar, What Witches Do, The Witches Goddess, and The Witches Way. And ye shall meet, and know, and remember, and love again. All right, so we're going to go to page 80. And this chapter, chapter 6, is not terribly long. It, it is, uh, it's about 13 pages, and it goes from page 80 all the way to page 92, when we come back to Midsummer, where we begin our installments of this book, and again we come full circle. So now we're going to get into the Beltane chapter. Now Beltane now, you know, nowadays in 2020 mostly is, is celebrated on May 1st, but in the eve, April 30th, Beltane Eve, that's a very magical time. In this book, Beltane is spelled slightly different. It's it, Now it's spelled B-E-L-T-A-N-E. -E. In this book it's spelled it's probably a more archa archaic uh, spelling or more true spelling, B-E-A-L-T-A-I-N-E. -E. And it's the 30th of April because I believe they're, they're, it's, it's about the, the eve of Beltane, April 30th eve. But let's get into it and see how it's presented. In the Celtic tradition, the two greatest festivals of all are Beltane and Samhain, the beginning of summer and the beginning of winter. Uh, just a, an aside here by, by the reader, uh, Samhain is, is Halloween, okay? So now we'll go back to the book. So again, they're saying, in the Celtic tradition, the two greatest festivals of all are Beltane and Samhain, the beginning of summer and the beginning of winter. To the Celts, as to all pastoral peoples, the year had two seasons, not four. Settler divisions concerned crop raisers rather than cattle raisers. Beltane, Beltane, oh I see it is Beltane, they're saying the new, the Anglicized, B-E-L-T-A-N-E, 
form corresponds to the modern Irish Gaelic word Beltane, pronounced Beoltinu, approximately, rhyming with winter. Beoltinu, winter. Oh, uh, rhyming with winter, I'm sorry, rhyming with winter. Beoltinu. Hmm. The name of the month of May, and so, and to the Scottish Gaelic word Beltiun, pronounced Bialtin, with the N like ni in onion, meaning May Day. So here we see the May 1st correspondence. Okay, back to the book. The original meaning is Belfire, the fire of the Celtic or photo or proto Celtic god, very variously known as Bel, Belly, Balar, Balor, or the Latinized Belinus names traceable back to the Middle Eastern Baal, which simply means Lord. So Baal means Lord. So if anybody is Lord, they are Baal. And you'll notice some of the ancient statues uh, show Baal with his fist up in the air, but that's just an aside by the reader. Back to the book. Some people have suggested that Bel is the British Celtic equivalent of the Gaulish Celtic Cernunos that may be true in the sense that both are archetypal male principal deities, mates of the Great Mother. But we feel that the evidence points to there being different aspects of that principle. Cernunos is always represented as the horned god. He is above all a nature deity, the god of animals, the Celtic Pan. Hearn the hunter who haunts Windsor Great Park with his wild hunt is a latter English Cernunos as his name suggests. He is also sometimes seen as a Chitotic underworld deity, the Celtic Pluto. Originally the horn god was doubtless the tribal totem animal whose mating with the Great Mother would have been the key fertility ritual of the totemic period. See Lethbridge's Witches Investigating an Ancient Religion, pages 25 to 27. Bell, on the other hand, was the bright one, god of light and fire. He had sun-like qualities. Classical writers equated him with Apollo. But he was not, strictly speaking, a sun god. As we have pointed out, the Celts were not solar-oriented. No people who worshipped the sun as a god would give it a feminine name. And grain, Irish and Scottish Gaelic for sun, is a feminine noun. So is more a personalized Irish name for the sun, as in the greeting Mordihut, may the sun bless you. It may seem a subtle difference but a god symbol is not always regarded as the same thing as the god himself by his worshippers. Christians do not worship a lamb or a dove, nor did ancient Egyptians worship a baboon or a hawk. Yet the first two are symbols of Christ and the Holy Spirit, and the second two of Thoth and Horus. To some people the sun was a god, but not to the Celts with their feminine son, even though Bel, Belor, Ogre, Ogma, Lug, and Lu had solar attributes. A traditional Scottish Gaelic folk prayer, see Kenneth Jackson's Celtic Miscellany Item 34, addresses the sun as, quote, happy mother of the stars, unquote, rising, quote, like a young queen in flower, unquote, for further evidence that the pagan Celts ritual calendar was oriented to the natural vegetation year and herd raising and not to the solar year or agriculture. See Fraser's Golden Bough, pages 828 to 830. A footnote here, number one, a family interest to us, Janet's maiden name was Owen, and Owen family tradition claims descent from the Canaanite lords of Shechem, who themselves claim to be of the seed of Baal. Continuing to page 82, symbolically, 
both the Sornunos aspect and the bell aspect can be seen as ways of visualizing the great father who impregnates the great mother. And there is, there is a footnote here, but we'll read that in a little bit. We, I don't want to break the, the gate and the, the pace here. So symbolically, both the Sornunos aspect and the bell aspect can be seen as ways of visualizing the great father who impregnates the great mother. And these are the two themes which dominate the May Eve, May Day, that May Eve, that's the April 30th, and May Day, that's May 1st, festival throughout Celtic and British folklore, fertility and fire. That was my aside about the dates there, but I just wanted to point that out, that, that's, that they're still being observed. If you may, April 30th would be May Eve, and May Day, May 1st. Okay, back to the book. Now, the bell fires were lit on the hilltops to celebrate the return of life and fertility to the world. In the Scottish Highlands, as late as the 18th century, Robert Graves tells us the white goddess, page 416, fire was kindled by drilling an oak plank. Quote, but only in the kindling of the Beltane need fire to which miraculous virtue was ascribed. It originally culminated in the sacrifice of a man representing the oak god, unquote. It is interesting that in Rome, the Vestial Virgins, guardians of the sacred fire, used to throw mannequins made of rushes into the river Tiber at the May full moon as symbolic human sacrifices. In pagan Ireland, no one could light a Beltane fire until the Ard Ri, the High King, had lit the first one on Tara Hill. In AD 433, St. Patrick showed an acute understanding of symbolism when he lit a fire on Slain Hill, 10 miles from Tara before the High King Loger lit his. He could not have made a more dramatic claim to the usurpation of spiritual leadership over the whole island. St. David made a similar historic gesture in Wales in the following century. Incidentally, much of the symbolism of Tara as the spiritual focus of ancient Ireland is immediately recognizable to anyone who has worked in a magic circle. Tara is in Meath, Mead Center, and was the seat of the High Kings. Its ground plan is still visible as great twin circular earthworks. Tara's ritual banqueting hall had a central hall for the High King himself surrounded by four inward facing halls which were allotted to the four provincial kingdoms. To the north for Ulster, to the east for Leinster, to the south for Munster, and to the west for Connacht. That is why the four provinces are traditionally known as fifths because of the vital center which completes them as spirit completes and integrates earth, air, fire, and water. Even the elemental ritual tools are represented in the four treasures of the Tuatha de Danen, the stone of foul destiny, which cried aloud when the rightful high king sat on it and the sword and spear of Lug, and the cauldron of the Dagda, the father god. Now, we, we want to take an aside here to go to this second footnote that had to do with symbolically both the Sununos aspect and the bell aspect can be seen as ways of visualizing the great father who impregnates the great mother. Here, footnote two before we continue up, up here. To there w is always overlap, the Cern Abbas giant cut in the Dorset turf is a Baal figure, as shown by his Herculean club and phallus, and his local name Hilith, is clearly the Greek Helios son, yet Cern is equally clearly Cernunos, and Baal Haman of Carthage was also a true Baal or Bel. His great mother consort was named Tanit, the Irish Dana, and the Welsh Don, yet he was horned. Okay, now we go back to page 83, continuing after we spoke about uh, the 
the stone uh, we the stone of foul destiny which cried aloud when the rightful king sat on it the sword and spear of Lug and the cauldron of the Dagda the father God continuing now all four were male symbols as one might expect in a warrior society but the archetypal matrilinear foundation still shone through at the inauguration of a lesser king ruler of a tuath or tribe this was a this was, quote, a symbolic marriage with sovereignty, a fertility rite for which the technical term was Banais Rigi, royal wedding, unquote. The same used to be true of the high kings, quote, the legendary queen Medeb, whose name means intoxication, was originally a personification of sovereignty, for we are told that she was the wife of nine kings of Ireland and elsewhere that only one of who was mated with her could be king. Of, of King Cormac, it was said, until Medeb slept with the lad, Cormac was not king of Ireland, unquote. Dylan and Chadwick, the Celtic realms, page 125. It is easy to see then why Tara had to be the igniting point for the community's regenerative bell fire and the same would have been true of the corresponding spiritual foci in other lands. Now, Ireland merely happens to be the country where the details of the tradition have been most clearly preserved. On the whole complex symbolism of Tara, the Rhesus Celtic heritage makes fascinating reading for witches and occultists. A feature of the Beltane Fire Festival in many lands was jumping over the fire. We say was, but in discussing seasonal folk customs, the past tense seldom proves to be entirely justified. Young people jumped it to bring themselves husbands or wives, intending travelers to ensure a safe journey, pregnant women to ensure an easy delivery, and so on. The cattle were driven through its ashes or between two such fires to ensure a good milk yield. The magical properties of the festival fire from a, form a persistent belief, as we shall also see under Midsummer, Samhain, and Yule. Both Scottish and Irish Gaelic, incidentally, have a saying, caught between two Beltane fires, meaning caught in a dilemma, taking, uh, no, talking of cattle. Talking of cattle next day, 1st May, was an important one in old Ireland. On that day, the women, children, and herdsmen took the cattle off to the summer pastures or bullies, uh, bule or bulliete on until Samhain. The same thing still happens on the same dates in the Alps and other parts of Europe. Other Irish and Scottish Gaelic, another Irish and Scottish Gaelic word for summer pasture is our. Arind and Doreen Valiente suggest witchcraft for tomorrow, page 164, that there is just a chance that the name Aradia is Celtic in origin, connected with this word. Now, in North Italian witchcraft, which, as Leland C. Bibliography has shown, derives from Etruscan roots, Aradia is the daughter of Diana, or as the Etruscans themselves call her, Aratimi, a variant of the Greek Artemis. The Etruscans flourished in Tuscany from about the 8th to the 4th century BC till the Romans conquered the last of their city-states. Volsini, Volsinii in 280 BC, from the 5th century onwards, they had much contact with the Gaulish Celts, sometimes as enemies and sometimes as allies, so it may very well be that Celts thought Aradia, oh, excuse me, so it may be very, so it may very well be that Celts brought Aradia there. Daughter, in the development of Pathanos, of, of, path, of Pantheons, often means Later version, and in the Aradia legend, Aradia learned much 
of her wisdom from her mother, which would tally with the undoubted fact that the brilliant Etruscan civilizations was admired and envied by their Celtic neighbors. It is interesting that in both Irish and Scottish Eridia, or a slight variant of it also means worth merit. And in case anyone thinks that Aradia reached Britain only through Leland's 19th century researchers in the form Herodias, she appears as an English witch goddess name in the 10th century canon Episcopi. Back to Beltane itself. Oak is the tree of the god of the waxing year. Hawthorne, at, its, at this season, is a tree of the white goddess. The strong folklore taboo in breaking hawthorn branches or bringing them into the house is traditionally lifted on May Eve when sprigs of it may be cut for the goddess's festival. Irish farmers and even earth-moving road builders are still reluctant to cut down lone hawthorns. A fairy hawthorn stood by itself in the middle of a pasture of the farm we lived on at Ferns Country Ferns County, Wexford, and similar respected examples can be seen all over the country. However, if you want blossoms for your ritual, for example, as chaplets in the women witch's hair, you cannot be certain of finding hawthorn in flower as early as May Eve, and you will probably have to be content with the young leaves. Our own solution is to be blackthorn, is to use blackthorn, whose flowers appear in April ahead of the leaves. Blackthorn, slow, is also a goddess tree at this season, but it belongs to the goddess in her dark devouring aspect as the bitterness of its autumn fruit would suggest. It used to be regarded as the witch's tree in the malevolent sense and unlucky. But to fear the dark aspect of the goddess is to miss the truth that she consumes only to give new birth. If the mysteries could be summed up in one sentence, it might be this, quote, at the core of the bright mother is the dark mother and at the core of the Dark Mother is the Bright Mother." Unquote. The sacrifice and rebirth theme of our Beltane ritual reflects this truth. So to symbolize the two aspects in balance, our women wear hawthorn in leaf and blackthorn in blossom intertwined. Another taboo lifted on May Eve was the early British one on hunting the hare. The hare, as well as being a moon animal, has a fine reputation for randiness and fecundity. So has the goat, and both figure in the sacrificial aspect of the May Day fertility traditions. The love chase is a widespread form of this tradition. It underlies the Lady Godiva legend and that of the Teutonic goddess Estare or Ostara, after whom Easter is named as well as such folk festivals as the May Day Obi Os ceremony in Padstow, Pad, Padstow, Cornwall. On the alluring and mysterious figure of the love chase, of the love chase, figure of the love chase woman, neither clothed, quote, neither clothed nor unclothed, neither on foot nor on horseback, neither on water nor on dry land, ne neither with nor without a gift, unquote, who is, quote, easily recognized as the May Eve aspect of the love and death goddess. See Graves, the White Goddess, page 403 onwards. There, uh, see, there doesn't seem to be an, oh, there, yeah, there's an end to the quote after death goddess. Okay. Now, but apart from, or rather in amplification of, the enactment of these goddess and god-king mysteries, Beltane, for ordinary people, was a festival of unashamed human sexuality and fertility. Maypole, nuts, and the gown of green 
were frank symbols of penis, testicles, and the covering of a woman by a man. Dancing round the maypole, hunting for nuts in the woods, greenwood marriages, and staying up all night to watch the May sunrise were unequivocal, unequivocal, unequivocal activities, which is why the Puritans suppressed them with such pious horror. Parliament made maypoles illegal in 1644, but they came back with the restoration in 1661, a 134-foot maypole was set up in the Strand. Continuing on page 86, Robin Hood, Maid Marian, and Little John played a big part in May Day folklore. And many people with surnames such as Hudson, Robinson, Jenkinson, Johnson, and Godkin owe their ancestry to some distant May Eve in the woods. Branches and flowers used to be brought back from the woods on May morning to decorate the village's doors and windows, and young people would carry garlands in procession singing. The gar gar garlands were usually of intersecting hoops. Sir J. G. Fraser wrote at the beginning of the century, quote, it appears that a hoop wreathed with rowan and marsh marigold and bearing suspended within it two balls is still carried on May Day by villagers in some parts of Ireland. The balls which are sometimes covered with gold and silver paper are said to have originally represented the sun and moon, unquote. The Golden Bough, page 159. Maybe, but Fraser's splendid pioneer though he was, often seemed to be, or in the climate of his time discreetly pretended to be, blind to sexual symbolism. Another May morning custom in Ireland was skimming the wells. You went to the well of a prosperous neighbor, presumably before he was up and about, and skimmed the surface, the surface of the water to acquire his luck for yourself. In another variant of this custom, you skimmed your own well to ensure a good butter yield for the year, and also, one may guess, to forestall any neighbor who was after your luck. Folk memory survives in curious ways. A Dublin friend, a good Catholic in his 50s, tells us that when he was a boy in North Country Longford, as father and mother used to take the children out at midnight on May Eve, and the whole family would dance naked in the young crops. The explanation the children were given was that this would protect them against catching colds for the next 12 months, but it would be interesting to know whether the parents themselves believed this to be true, to be the true season, or were really concerned with the fertility of the crops and were giving the children a respectable explanation in case they talked particularly in the priest's hearing. Our friend also tells us that the crops were always sown by 25th March to ensure a good harvest, and 25th March used to be regarded as the spring equinox. Compare 25th December for Christmas instead of the astronomically exact solstice. Quote, of the most widespread superstitions in England held that washing the face on May morning do would beautify the skin in may morning dew would beautify the skin unquote the encyclopedia britannica quote says uh, quote pepys alludes to the practice of his diary and as late as 1791 a london newspaper reported that yesterday being the first of may a number of persons went into the fields and bathed their faces with the dew on the grass with the idea that it would render them beautiful, unquote. Ireland has the same tradition. But to return to the Greenwood. Today, overpopulation and not underpopulation is humanity's problem, and more enlightened attitudes to sexual relationships, though still developing unevenly, would hardly be comparable, would hardly be compatible with the Greenwood 
orgy method of producing new crop of Hudson's and Godkin's. But both the cheerful frankness and the dark mystery can and should be expressed. That is what the Sabbaths are all about. In our Beltane rite, we have woven as much as we could of the traditional symbolism. Short of overloading it and blunting its edge with obscurity, or worse, taking the fun out of it, we leave it to the reader to discern the weaving. But perhaps it is worth mentioning that the high priest's declamation, quote, I am a stag of seven times, unquote, consists of those lines of the song of Amer Amergen, which belong according to Robert Graves' allocation to the seven tr tree months in the Oak King cycle. We have added one quite separate little rite, which was suggested to us by reading Ovid's Fasti. On May, on 1st May, the Romans paid homage to their lairs or household gods, and it seemed appropriate for us to do the same on the night when the bell fire is extinguished and rekindled. All homes, to be honest, possess objects which are in effect lars. Ours include a foot-high Venus de Milo, acquired by Stuart's parents before he was born, slightly battered, twice broken, and two and mended. She was she has come to me to be a much loved guardian of the home and a true lar. She now smiles Hellenistically down on our Beltane rites. Other witches may also feel that this little annual homage is a pleasant custom to adopt. Now continuing to page 88, we go to the preparation. The cauldron is placed in the center of the circle with a candle burning inside it. This represents the bell fire. Sprigs of hawthorn and blackthorn decorate the altar and chaplets of the two combined with the thorns clipped off are made for the women witches. A shot of hairspray on the blossoms beforehand will help to prevent the petals falling. The hawthorn and blackthorn should be gathered on May Eve itself and it is customarily to apologize and explain to each tree as you cut it down. If oak leaves can be found at this season in your area, the chaplet of them is made for the high priest in his role as oak king. A permanent oak crown is a useful coven accessory, see under Yule page 145. A green scarf or piece of gauze at least a yard square is laid by the altar. As many wax tapers as there are people in the coven are placed close to the cauldron. The cakes for consecration on this occasion should be a bowl of nuts. If you are including the rite for the guardian of the house, this or these are placed on the edge of the circle near the east candle with one or two Jaw sticks in a holder ready for light for lighting at the appropriate moment. If your guardian is not movable, a symbol of it may stand in its place. For example, if it is a tree in your garden, bring a, in a sprig of it again with the appropriate apology and explanation. The ritual. After the witch's rune, the coven spread themselves around the circle area between the cauldron and the perimeter and start a soft rhythmic clapping. The high priest picks up the green scarf, gathers it lengthwise like a rope and holds it with one end in each hand. He starts to move towards the high priestess make, making it making as though to throw the scarf over her shoulders and pull her to him but she backs away from him tantalizingly. While the coven continue their rhythmic, rhythmic clapping, the high priestess continues to elude the pursuing high priest. She beckons to him and teases him, but always steps back before he can capture her with the scarf. She weaves in and out of the coven, and the other women step in the high priest's way to help her elude him. After a while, say after two or three laps of the circle, the high priestess allows the high priest to capture her by throwing the scarf over her head and to and head to 
behind her shoulders and pulling her to him. They kiss and separate, and the high priest hands the scarf to another man. Then the, okay, the other man then pursues his partner, who eludes him, beckons to him, and teases him in exactly the same way. The clapping goes on all the time. See plate 12. After a while, she, after a while, she too allows herself to be captured and kissed. The man then hands a scarf to another man, and the pursuit game continues until every couple in the coven has taken part. The last man hands the scarf back to the high priest. Once again, the high priest pursues the high priestess, but this time the pace is much slower, almost stately, and her alluding and beckoning more solemn, as though she is tempting him into danger. And this time, the others do not intervene. The pursuit continues until the high priestess places herself between the cauldron and the altar, facing the altar and the two or three paces from it. The high priest halts with his back to the altar and captures her with the scarf. They embrace solemnly but wholeheartedly, but after a few seconds of the kiss, the high priest lets the scarf fall from his hands and the high priestess releases him and takes a step backwards. The high priest drops to his knees, sits back on his heels, and lowers his head, chin on chest. The high priestess spreads her arms, signaling for the clapping to stop. She then calls forward two women by name and places them on each side of the high priest facing inwards so that the three tower over him. The high priestess picks up the scarf and the three of them spread it between them over the high priest. They lower it slowly and then release it so that it covers his head like a shroud. The high priestess sends the two women back to their places and calls forward two men by name. She instructs them to extinguish the two altar candles, not the earth candle. And when they have done so, she sends them back to their places. The high priestess then turns and kneels close to the cauldron facing it. She gestures to the rest of the coven to kneel around the cauldron with her. Only the high priest stays where he is in front of the altar, kneeling but dead. When everyone is in place, the high priestess blows out the candle in the cauldron and is silent for, the mo for a moment. Then she says, quote, the bell fire is extinguished and the oak king is dead. He has embraced the great mother and died of his love. So it has been year by year since time began. Yet if the oak king is dead, he who is the god of the waxing year, all is dead. The fields bear no crops, the trees bear no fruit, and the creatures of the great mother bear no young. What shall we do, therefore, that the oak king may live again? The coven reply, rekindle the bell fire. The high priestess says, so mote it be. The high priestess takes a taper, raises, goes, rises, goes, to the altar, lights the taper from the earth candle, and kneels again at the cauldron. She relights the cauldron and candle with the ta her taper. See plate 7. Then she says, Take each of you a taper and light it from the bell fire. The coven do so, and finally the high priestess lights a second taper for herself, summoning the original two women to accompany her. She rises and turns to face the high priest. She gestures to the two women to lift the scarf from the high priest's head. They do so, see plate 8, and lay it on the floor. The high priestess sends the two women back to their places and summons the two men. She instructs them to relight the altar candles with their tapers. When they have done so, she sends them back to their places. She then holds out one of her tapers to the high priest, who so far has not moved, and says, Come back to us, O king, that the land may be fruitful. The high, priestess, the high, excuse me, the high priest rises and accepts the taper. He says, I am a stag of seven times. I am a wide flood on a plain. I am a wind on the deep waters. I am a shining tear of the sun. I am a hawk on a cliff. I am fair among flowers. I am a god who sets the head afire with smoke. 
The high priestess and high priest led a ring dance around the cauldron, the rest of the coven following, all carrying their tapers. The, moon, the mood becomes joyous. As they dance, they chant, Oh, do not tell the priest of our art, or he would call it a sin. But we shall be out in the woods all night, a conjuring summer in. And we bring you news by word of mouth for women, cattle, and corn. Now is the sun come up from the south with oak and ash and thorn. They repeat with oak and ash and thorn, ad lib, till the priest, the high priestess, till the, until the high priestess, till the high, till the high priestess blows out her taper and lays it by the cauldron. The rest do the same. Then the entire coven link hands and circle faster and faster. Every now and then the high priestess calls a name or a couple's names and whoever is called breaks away, jumps the cauldron and rejoins the ring. When all have jumped, the high priestess cries down and everybody sits. That apart from the great rite is the end of the Beltane ritual. But if the guardian of the house is to be honored, it is most suitably done while the rest of the coven are relaxing. The guardian ritual is, of course, performed by the couple or individual in whose house the Sabbath is being held, who may or may not be the high priestess and high priest. Here we're going to read the footnote here for number three. This only substantial item in the Book of Shadows Beltane ritual is a slightly altered version of verse 5 of Rudyard Kilping's poem, A Tree Song from the Wheelan's Sword story in Puck of Pook's Hill. It is one of Gerald Gardner's happier borrowings, and we are sure the shade of Kipling does not mind. So, continuing now. That apart from the great rite is the end of the Beltane ritual. But if the guardian of the house is to be honored, it is most suitably done while the rest of the co covenant are relaxing. The guardian ritual is, of course, performed by the couple or individual in whose house the Sabbath is being held, who may or may not be the high priestess and high priest. If, if it is an individual... His or her working partner will assist. If he or she is unpartnered, the high priestess or high priest may do so. The couple approach the east candle while the rest of the coven remain seated, but turn to face east with them. One of the couple lights the jaw sticks in front of the guardian while the other says, Guardian of this house, watch over it in the year to come, till again the bell fire is extinguished and relit. Bless this house and be blessed by it. Let all who live here and all friends who are welcomed here prosper under this roof. So mote it be. All say, so mote it be. The couple rejoin the coven. Beltane and Samhain are traditional mischief nights, what Doreen Valiente has called, quote, the in-between times when the year was swinging on its hinges the doors of the other world were open and anything could happen, unquote. So when all is done, the great rite celebrated and the wine and nuts shared, this is the night for forfeits in imposing bizarre little tasks or ordeals. The high, priestess, the high priestess's inventiveness may run wild, always remembering, of course, that it is the high priest's final privilege to devise a forfeit for her. One final point if you are holding your Beltane festival outdoors, the bell fire which is lit should be a bonfire. This should be laid ready with kindling which will call quickly. This should be laid ready with kindling which will catch quickly. But the odd but the old bell fire which the high priestess extinguishes should be a candle protected if necessary inside a lantern. It would not be practicable unless the Sabbath were a large scale affair to extinguish a bonfire in the middle of the ritual. If you live in an area where witchcraft activity is known and respected or at least tolerated, 
and have the use of a hilltop, the sudden blazing of a Beltane fire in the darkness may stir some interest, interesting folk memories. But if you do light a bonfire on this or any other occasion, have a fire extinguisher ready to hand in case of emergency. Witches who start heath fires or woodland fires will quickly lose any local respect they may have built up, and quite right too. With that said, one wants to make sure that witches are not being framed by, their, by those who are in opposition to them. Perhaps witches are being framed by people who are against them. You never know. So now we're going to uh, take a moment to look at the, the plates they're in, plate 8 and plate 12. We're going to look for that in a moment. All right, now that we've finished our chapter 6, we're going to go ahead and take a look at the plates, plate number 8 and plate number 12 that show some of the ritual. This one over here is for Midsummer, so we're not going to look at that. We're going to look at this one. It's for Beltane. This Beltane. And this is Rebirth of the Oak King. So you have the High Priestess, and you have the High Priestess as the Oak King with his wreath and his rebirth, and the High Priestess presiding in his rebirth. And we have... Um, another coven member here in this book officiating and other people are holding this sort of gossamer cloth to sort of it's sort of like a makeshift kind of a temple or altar so uh, this is how simply but how how beautifully some of these these rituals can be done one doesn't have to have a whole lot of money one just one just needs a little bit of creativity and to put a little thought into it and, and a little of one's own emotions into it. So this is number eight, Beltane, Rebirth of the Oak King. All right, now we're going to go to another, another page, which has the plate number 12 on it. And this, uh, we're going to deal with this one up here. The other ones are for different rituals. So we're just going to deal with this one here, number 12, so we have Lug Lugnasid and Beltane, the love chase. So this is part of the ritual called the love chase, and it happens in Lugnasid and Beltane. And we have uh, coven members uh, doing the ritual of the love chase and all, all presiding in, in that. And everybody takes their, their place and everybody has a role to play, and it brings community together and people are able to continue on with their traditions and, and also bestow their traditions to the generations that follow. And these are beautiful rituals that need to be preserved. And I think this is a, a beautiful book that needs to be preserved. And that's why I've been going ahead and reading it for you and have given it to you uh, in installments of each chapter. They're all completed and please make sure that you you look at our midsummer one that we had done uh, now almost a year ago. So we've been sticking with this for a year and it's been a wonderful journey. And we have the, the witch's bonfire and we have the and the, the beautiful wilderness, the well controlled fire. We have the the moon with the Wiccans holding their hands around to form the ring around the moon. So that's eight Sabbath to Witches by Janet and Stuart Farrar. And it's published by Phoenix. Publishing Incorporated. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and we're going to close the circle and therefore we're going to start with, we're going to go backwards is what we did before. We're going to undo Wittishans starting in the north. We're going to undo the sacred space, the sacred circle. And then we're going to undo the sacred time with the bell. All right. We're going to start with north. I call upon the guardians of the watchtower 
of the north, the archangel Uriel, who presides over the cold, dry winds of the north and the gnomes, the elementals for the northern direction. Thank you for lending your magic to our circle. And please come again when we beckon you. So mote it be, you may depart. And we now call upon the guardians of the Watchtower of the West, the Archangel Gabriel, who presides over the cold, wet winds of the West, and the Undines, the Watcher Elementals. Thank you for lending your magic to our circle. Uh, you may depart now. Please come again when we beckon you. So would it be. We call upon the guardians of the Watchtower of the South, the Archangel Michael, and the hot, dry winds of the South, and the Salamander. Salamanders are the fire elementals. Thank you for lending your magic to our circle. You may depart and please come again when we beckon you, so mote it be. I call upon the guardians of the watchtower of the east, the archangel Raphael, who presides over the warm, moist winds of the east, and the sylphs, the air elementals. Thank you for lending your magic to our circle. You may depart and please come again when we beckon you, so mote it be. I call upon the God, the Earth God, Pan, all the Earth Gods, Jesus Christ, Sir Nunos, Geb. Thank you for lending your magic to our circle. You may depart and Please come again when we beckon you, so mote it be. I call upon the goddess, the sky goddess of Nuit, and also the fertility goddesses, the mother goddesses. Mary is a sky goddess and a mother goddess. So is Nuit a sky goddess and a mother goddess. The, the goddesses of fertility and Caridwin and Inanna, Lakshmi, who, who is there are some of the goddesses have many roles to play. Thank you for lending your magic to our circle. You may depart now and please come again when we beckon you. So mote it be. And now we're going to go ahead and we're going to undo the sacred time. Our sacred circle is ended. Thank you everybody for being with us through this series, this journey through Eight Sabbaths for Witches by Janet and Stuart Farrar. We've enjoyed it. We hope you did too. And stay tuned. We're going to have a lot more installments to come with other subjects and classes that we've, we've created and other books that we enjoy. So, Mary Meet. Mary part and Mary meet again. This is the Goodly Christian Witch. Farewell for now. <laughs>